For all the guests who are here, I am Todd Simmons, and I'm the executive director of JPAS, and I am absolutely thrilled about the panel that we have put together today um, to discuss why Paul Robeson matters. Um, we have our coming up the production of um, about Paul Robeson that's going to be at the JPAC. But before we get into that, I want to introduce briefly our panel, our Panels to read all about their bios, please go to our website at jpas.org. You can read it, but just a brief overview of our panel today. We have beginning with Dr. Eva Mayum, who is the Assistant Professor of History at Dillard University here in New Orleans. Her specialties are American, African-American and intellectual history. She is a founder of the research organization <laughs> Université Saint Mir and translated as a university without walls, under which she conducts genealogical research and projects. We have then Bruce Sunpai Barnes, who is a New Orleans musician, book author, ethnographic photographer. Sunpai is the big chief of the, the, the Northside Skull and Bone Gang, one of the oldest Afro-Creole Afro carnival groups in the United States. He is a member of the Black Men of Labor, Social Aid and Pleasure Club, and the band leader of Sun Pie and the Louisiana Sunspots. Sun Pie is a former National Park Service Ranger, former high school biology teacher, former college football All-American, and former NFL player with the Kansas City Chiefs. About as uh, renaissance as Mr. Robinson was. <laughs> Next we have Ms. Diane Honoré. <laughs> <laughs> New Orleans 6 4 native Diane <clears throat> Gumbo Marie Honore is a local history buff, event producer, and award winning cultural preservationist who founded the Black Storyville Baby Dolls, the Amazon's Benevolent Society, and co founded Unheard Voices of Louisiana. She has written, produced, and presented many history related music and food events, panel discussions, tours, and ex exhibits over several decades. Welcome, Diane. Mr. Ivan Griffin is a vocal instructor and bass baritone um, who brings extensive operatic and theatrical background to Loyola University in New Orleans, where he teaches. His engagements include the Lawyer Frazier in Michigan Opera Theater's Porgy and Bess, a role that he was invited to reprise during an extensive European tour. He has also appeared as Reverend Olin Blitch in Susanna with Buffalo Lyric Opera, Count on the Viva in The Marriage of Figaro, and Papageno in The Magic Flute with Fayetteville Summer Opera and Western New York Opera Theater, respectively, as well as several performances with New Orleans Opera Creole, of which our founder is also on our panel. We'll get to her next. Welcome, um, Ivan. And as I was speaking, uh, next we have Giovanna Joseph, who is the founder and artistic director of the award-winning Opera Creole. <laughs> her research on operatic composers of African descent has been featured in the New Yorker, Southern Living Magazine, and on NPR. She was previously honored as a standard bearer of Louisiana culture on Le Grand Tour, a documentary for French TV, and music inside and out with Gwen Tompkins. Her company received the Gambit Affiliated Classical Arts Award in 2018 and 2019, and in 2020, the Coalition of African Americans in the Performing Arts of Washington, D.C. honored them. Welcome, Giovanna. Thank you, it's great to be here. Now we have Delphio Marsalis, who I'm gonna unmute real quickly because he is asking to unmute. Um, born and raised in New Orleans. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh sorry. Trombonis <laughs> Del okay. Delphio Marsalis has dedicated his life to music, theater, and education. At the age of 17, he began his career as a producer and has to date produced over 140 recordings, garnering one Grammy Award and several nominations. In 2011, he was named an NEA Jazz Master, the highest honor given to a jazz musician in America. Welcome, Delphio. Thank you. Next, JP Morell. JP began his law career at Morell & Morell LLC, which he co-founded with his father, Arthur Morell. During his time, he also worked as a member of the Orleans Parish um, Office of Indigent Public Defender Program, serving as a public defender for the magistrate court until his election to the Louisiana State Legislature. Today, he is uh, of counsel to the Middleburg Riddle Group 
a New Orleans-based law firm. Of course, he was our state senator in 2018, was named Legislator of the Year by the Alliance for Good Government. JP, welcome with us today. Thank you. And next we have Tommy Merrick, who is a producer and director who spent decades telling the stories of African-American women and the disenfranchised through the arts. She attended Xavier University and after graduation, attended University of Michigan, where she obtained her master's degree and immediately began working on her PhD. She later moved to New York and began studying with renowned theater director, producer, and lifelong friend and mentor, Jean Frankel. It was there that she made her stage and directorial debut. In 1992, Ms. Merrick founded Voices in the Dark Repertory Theater Company in New Orleans. Today, she's working towards mounting New Orleans' first historical outdoor drama, The Code Noir, written by her and Mark Sumner. Welcome, Tom, Tom, uh, welcome, Tommy. And last but not least, Sogi Kenyatta. Sogi is a author and performer of The World Is My Home, The Life of Paul Robeson, which is the most requested Pan-American show on the American and Caribbean educational circuit about the Harlem Renaissance, diversity and social justice. His production will be debuted at JPAC on January 23rd and 24th. He has performed his show in over hundred universities and schools from Yale, John Hopkins and UCLA, from University of the West Indies to the University of London, as well as the US embassies in 16 countries around the world, including 10 Caribbean islands. He has performed in the U.S. Virgin Islands, Bahamas, Grand Caymans, and Barbados. With that, let me ask Stogie to start our panel discussion with a few words about the show that we're bringing. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, nice to see all of you. Uh, and uh, in the middle of the pandemic, I, I hope your families and uh, friends uh, are healthy, happy, and in a state of grace uh, to the degree that we can be uh, in this. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's a one-man theatrical performance um, about the tragedies and triumphs of both sin. It's a comprehensive show. You don't need to know anything about it, about the subject matter, um, if you come to it, because um, you meet him. I open the show. I play 12 characters in the piece. Um, I open it with his father, William Drew Robeson, who escaped from the Robeson Plantation uh, on the Underground Railroad with Harry Tubman and brought him to Philadelphia. And there he went on to, of course, go to college and get married and marry a school teacher and raise these five amazing children. And so um, it's a comprehensive piece that covers both Harlem Renaissances and shows the history of our unique and uh, dynamic culture. and. Um, and explores, you know, uh, our contribution uh, to humanity at large. We have, it, it's difficult to summarize the life of Paul Robeson in an hour we have here to talk about. I think of, you know, his life as a performer, as a scholar, and as an activist. Based upon those three things, and this panel was put together with individuals who are leaders in all three of those categories today. Why do, and this is for the panel as a discussion, my, my job here today I consider to just be one of sitting back, listening and learning. Why is Paul Robeson the most important black hero today? Do you wanna start that, that question, Sogi, and then pass it to the group? Sure. Um, uh, in my opinion, he's uh, easily one because um, we have uh, the traditional uh, linchpins of Black history, which would be Martin, Malcolm, Frederick Douglass, and um, and those folks. And uh, and although Martin and Malcolm are the most famous, uh, none of us would really want their lives because the sacrifice is just too great. And they had an area of expertise, and that's what they ran with. Um, the two professions uh, which Robeson set the paradigm for the professions which African Americans became millionaires, wealthy, successful, and famous were athletics, entertainment, <laughs> law, and social justice. It was these fields that raised us as a culture, collectively as a people. And in today's watered down society of you know, artificial intelligence and um, boy 
bands where no one plays an instrument and um, this thing. The attractiveness of Robeson because he excelled in entertainment and in athletics and then became a, graduated from college, valedictorian, magna cum laude in 1919 when America was a liberate nation and then go on to go to law school and then go into entertainment. And then even though he was wealthy, he fought for social justice for his people behind him to found the OAU, the Organization of African Unity, with, along with W.E.B. Du Bois, Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kenyatta, and Nami, uh, Namdi Azikiwe, um, to form that union and to have that global perspective that the continental African and the African American were one people. All of these things made him intellectually, he was left brain, he was right brain. And it's the equivalent of saying Martin Luther King, um, it's the equivalent of saying that Michael Jordan and Dr. J and LeBron James and Muhammad Ali went to law school and then later, you know, uh, went on to also write and produ produce and entertain. Uh, he was just um, the broadest, he had the broadest scope towards him. And he lived under a tougher social criteria, being born in 1898, one generation removed from slavery. For him to achieve as magnificently as he did, under those conditions, uh, he destroyed the myth of uh, black intelligentsia by mastering 16 languages, all the romance languages he spoke fluently. And to do though, when he studied University of London, School of uh, Af Oriental and African Studies in London, uh, to have a law degree, to be an all American football player while graduating valedictorian, he is just simply on par and there's no one else that grasp the both thing because you know they accepted that we were better physically and athletically but the intellectual pursuit brooks and brought that to the table at a time when uh few had and then to combine that with athletics and entertainment and a beautiful bass baritone voice to perform and sing and a social consciousness that said that you know that i am my brother's keeper um mm -hmm. i just think that he is he's, uh, unquestionably um uh tremendously unique i like to throw it to so many of our historians who are on here about what was life like, what, what he was fighting through at that time. What, what would it have been that he was really fighting with day to day that even today we don't have an understanding of? Well, I think that um, we have an understanding of it, particularly those uh, uh, of us of African American descent, uh, we understand it still today. Um, it's the same. Um, when um, Mr. Kenyatta said that Kenyatta said that um, they uh, accepted his athleticism um, in his um, in the introduction to his autobiography, Sterling Stuckey reminds us that when he was at at Rutgers at 17 years old, and I'm sure you're familiar with that as well. His, he, he, he Quoting him, he says that his classmates tried to kill him when he went out for the book, football team. They ganged up on him, they broke his nose, dislocated his shoulders, cleated his hand, tearing away his fingernails. Mm -hmm. And it caused him to pause there to question whether or not he should uh, consider, uh, he, he should continue that. And, and so he was one of two, as I'm, I'm sure I'm just preaching this to the choir here of the speakers, but for those who are listening who don't know, he was only one of two black students at Rutgers during his four years there. And I think uh, what this tells us today, it, it, it speaks to many of, of our, um, of, of many people, African-Americans, uh, non-whites, who are the only in a situation the only Black, the only Asian, uh, the kinds of things that others where they are, are, are will tolerate. They continue to tolerate this kind of injustice and brutal, uh, brutality and violence against the only. And I thought that uh, when Stucky mentioned this and also in his autobiography, uh, he says, what is it? It was some mystery that kept him going um, through things like this. And he said, but he remembered that his father had impressed upon him, quoting that when out on the football field, 
or in a classroom or anywhere else, I had to show that I could take whatever they handed out because this was part of our struggle. Yeah. And, and isn't this relevant today that um, whether it's the president of the United States, the real president, Barack Obama, or, um, <laughs> or now the MVP, Madam Vice President, Kamala Harris, the first has um, strictures placed on them that uh, no one after them may not have to follow or to do. And that is to prove not only as many African-Americans have heard in their lifetime, that you have to be twice as good as white people, but also to prove that you can do it. Um, I'm a child of the, 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 you know, my adolescence coming up in the 1960s. And, it, and, and I heard over and over from many people uh, that when you're the first, you have to be better, you have to do it, um, do it uh, excellently, so that it opens the doors for others. And I think that Robeson was quite aware of that. Yeah, I agree with that, those, <laughs> all of those comments. And, and um, you know, even today when I was, you know, growing up, uh, you know, years ago as a, you know, playing football and the same thing, I grew up in a very rural, uh, small community, you know, being a, the only one on the football team, I was pretty positive that, you know, these, uh, I believe what happened with Robeson is they woke him up the first time yeah. they, they, they got rough with him. They woke him up, but, um, but they didn't scare him. They just woke him up uh, because he was the son of a former enslaved African-American. And I, I can understand that. My father was born in 1908 and my grandfather was born in 1850 and I was freed when he was 16 years old. So, uh, you know, when you come with that kind of uh, perspective about what it means to survive uh, a few scraped knuckles just means that whoever that was that did that on that field um, just woke him up enough to show them that he was not afraid of them in any kind of way and, and, and never would. And even if he was, they would never know it. So he, he gained their respect by whooping their ass in the debate team on the football field and the choir and the glee club and everywhere else they ever saw him, uh, which is why he was feared by the United States government yes. uh, because he was unafraid and, and, and he had a world perspective. Uh, he, he used that football field to, to gain access to the rest of his life. Uh, I did some similar things and I learned about Paul Robeson, you know, like from my father, um, just hearing him mention him. I didn't really know exactly who he was, you know, until some years later, you start to pick up on how much this, know, this man has done. Uh, and having been in the, the park service and been, a, been the only black park ranger in the Southwest region in, in 1983, I'm talking a region that covers uh, 14 states Wow. The only black park ranger. And it was serious enough that the regional director and the director of the department interior gave me their private phone numbers because they, they feared for my life in Northern Arkansas. <clears throat> and I understood why later uh, I was living, you know, five miles from the national Klan headquarters, <laughs> half, of, <laughs> half of the, I didn't know that when I signed the contract, I was in college, you know, but the national headquarters was there and half of the, Park Service employees were in the Klan. <laughs> and the first think... thing they did was invite me to the Kiwanis Club meeting, which they held every wow. Wednesday. And it was the Sheriff's Department and a bunch of folks who ran the Klan. And they had invited David Duke there. And they had me do a slide program about the park just so they could all see who I was and identify me. <laughs> so, hmm. you know, those are, those are the kinds of things that, that he was facing and far more as well of course you know but I, I can definitely identify with some of the perspective that he had and you know it continues today. I think one of the most amazing things about Paul Robeson are the choices he made when he didn't have to. 
And yeah. when I say that he made these choices, even though his father was a slave and, and, and later became free, he had a path. He had an economic path. He had a path to education. He had a path. But the choices he made is what made that man and still makes that man so, so phenomenal. It, the choices he made, the many, the variety of things that he did from politics to athleticism, to, to music, to global activism, but he decided that he was going to live the path and go the path of that of W.E.B. Du Bois, who said that we as, as Black people living in America, no matter what it is we do, everything we do must be for us, near us, by us, and about us. And it's just amazing what Paul Robeson, the path he chose to make in light of all the adversity, especially when you come down to McCarthyism and that era. Mm -hmm. I would like to add, um, it's very interesting and wonderful to me that we are, we are picking up this topic of Paul Robeson. Uh, it comes at a time after the Black Lives Matter movement that a lot of classical organizations and opera organizations are looking at their diversity and looking um, how they can be more accessible to the people. And mm. Paul Robeson for me represents two wonderful things. The voice that could uh, penetrate all matters of physiology, organize <laughs> the brain and get to people in a way that someone else may not. And his use of text. So here's this classical voice, but he takes Old Man River and changes it into an activist song instead of a song of a man who's just accepted his fate in life and he just wants to roll along like the old man river. No, he takes Beethoven's um, Ode to Joy and turns it into a song of peace with new lyrics to incite and then motivate people. He um, sings the uh, aria from Mozart's uh, magic flute uh, uh -huh. uh, that it's a it's a prayer to Isis and Osiris uh -huh. and he talks about it as um, this is something w uh, dedicated and for people who are fighting against the fight of good and evil uh -huh. who are working in in the midst uh -huh. of good and evil and trying to find their way so he took this voice he took this art form and he's all people reference him as talk in singing spirituals and that sort of thing. But he took a, a wonderful classical art form and turned it into something that spoke to the people. Um, one of my favorite stories is that when the Sydney Opera House was being built in Australia, this beautiful opera house that's on the water, um, mm -hmm. as they were laying the foundation and the first pieces of wood in, in its formation, he went there, not on a stage, but he went in the midst, he went to sing for the workers mm -hmm. and to show them that he appreciated their labor, that he was uh, in solidarity with them in terms of their rights. Mm -hmm. He went to countries and sang in English and sang in their language. He was a, 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 a lyricist. Um, you can't, there's not very much of a parallel as to someone who could take an art form and, and redirect it and, and refocus the conversation about people's lives and people's full humanity. He talks about Othello, not from a perspective of a man who kills someone out of jealousy and self-hatred, but from the perspective of a man um, having enough of his humanity being challenged and being um, uh, devalued. And with so many things coming at him, coupled with this person uh, speaking uh, about his wife's infidelity, he, he believes that Otello doesn't kill about the infidelity, but he kills about the having the last possible uh, ability to stand any more of his humanity being challenged. 
-hmm. as a black man, as a Moor in as this Moore. community mm -hmm. where he was the other. Mm -hmm. So it, I mean, and looking at all that, it just absolutely blows my mind as to who he is and what he has to say. And as opera companies are now looking at diversity, I wanna just go to my notes and read something that he said. In many lands, the arts and especially music have been cut off from the general life of the nation. They have become the source of enjoyment for a comparative few, a so-called elite who feel that culture should be somewhat un unapproachable except to their own understanding or at times completely non-understanding selves. Mm -hmm. Now, what is unfortunate is that he did not know the history of people of African descent in opera, which is part of the mission of Opera Creole. We go back to look at hundreds and hundreds of years of black composers uh, in opera and musicians of classical music. We've got 500 years of history where we have contributed to this art form. It is our art form. And he was, at that time, he was, he was cut off from it. He was not likely to be hired to sing uh, in an opera house. Opera. Mm -hmm. But he took that music, a beautiful music in his beautiful voice and championed the causes and feelings and motivations that people need. And I think that's important part to look at in, in this time where, where we're still in 20, 20, 21, we still have to say Black Lives Matter. I mean, I don't know why we have to say that. Mm -hmm. Can I add something real quick? Oh, thank you so much. Um, just, uh, just, just something real quick. I mean, because I know <clears throat> there are. I'm in. I'm in a room with titans who know far more than I. But uh, something that 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 really triggered me that you said not triggered in a bad way, not in the not in the Donald Trump Jr. trigger, but kind of triggered a thought <laughs> was you have so many young people, and I say young people. I'm kind of like an old, I guess, an old soul because I'm probably one of the younger people on the panel, but. <laughs> When you look at Black Lives Matter, the movement really evolved, I think, as people who were younger realized they were part of a larger long term movement and they weren't reinventing the wheel. Right. And when you really look at Paul Roberson and you look at what he was, he's such a titanic figure because you look at all these individuals who kind of are national figures in this movement across a variety of different fields. Uh -huh. You look at people like John Legend, uh, Denzel Washington, Kyler Kaepernick, our former President Obama. Paul Robeson was like all of them in one all person. Of them. In one person. I mean, he was a musician, an actor, athlete, activist, lawyer who got a degree from Columbia while he was in, while he was working. Yeah, I, I mean, mm -hmm. it's just, it makes you wonder on this larger level what he would have been but for <laughs> reconstruction jim crow and mccarthy i mean mm -hmm. he accomplished all of this with every <laughs> single weapon force of racism aimed at him squarely he did yeah. all of that with all of the weight of all of that on him and he still accomplished so much and you you look at people right now and you look at what we're doing and we're i mean obviously the the, the country's gone through a reckoning but when you look at people that broke down those barriers and laid the groundwork, in particular, people like Paul Robeson and feel like Josephine Baker, who people don't really think mm -hmm. about as activists, mm -hmm. people, people who, they went abroad to shame America to be better. Mm -hmm. And I, that's, that's all I want, I want to add, go back to listening. But I mean, like they were the, the, proto, the prototypical african-american activists who when they saw they could not amplify their voice at home they went abroad and when all the rich people at home were listening to all the french singers and look at all the all, all the europeans and all they're looking to they were forced to deal with him and deal with josephine because whatever what the intellectuals were listening to were those two so you couldn't ignore them paul robeson was such a threat was such yes. a threat to the American way of life that I dare say he is the only Negro who they would not let travel outside of the United States. <laughs> Took his passport. Okay? Here they are telling us to go back to Africa mm -hmm. and they won't let this man leave. Right. That's right. how much of a threat he was to the overall <laughs> justice system or injustice system of America. 
What a powerful man to erect a stage on the border of the U.S., United States, right. and Canada, Canada. <laughs> and perform for thousands of people because they refused to let him out of the United States. <laughs> How powerful is that? And, and I wanted to uh, add uh, to that, especially following um, uh, Ms. Marek, Ms. Marek and Ms. Joseph, uh, the, the thing that in Here I Stand uh, he talks about um, and his biographers, I think there's also, I have a, another one that uh, biography by his son and others. It's like, what is at the root of all of this? <laughs> and it was mm. in his home. It was in his home. It says that, uh, you know, his mother died when Ed Robeson was only six years old. But, but here it says that it had the, the roots of Paul Robeson were in both the sacred and the secular that they meshed together in the home and the music uh, was songs of love and longing, trials and triumphs, deep flowing rivers and rollicking Brooks hymn songs and ragtime ballads, gospel blues and the healing comfort mm. in the sorrow of the spirituals. And he says that um, what, what, uh, what the, the uh, uninformed calls something bad uh, called socialism, said that his home and his community represented what we would understand in its intellectual sense of socialism, that his father said that uh, there was a shared value rather than a competitive value. So he found that here it's quoting success not measured is taught from his father in terms of money and personal advancement, but rather the goal must be the richest and highest development of one's own potential. And so he saw this communal, uh, communal or community affection of black people or of the downtrodden. And so that's why he would go sing to people that others uh, would ignore. And that he, uh, there was no question that his loyalty was to the masses of blacks. And Robeson said himself that this was sacred. This is what's wow. propelling him. And this is what, what, what you all have said there. Just, uh, just gave me chills at the sense because here I, I saw this, that how do we understand this man? We understand that at his very core, inherent in his being is this affection for the masses and not for oneself. It's not for me. So I'm going to go stand on the border. And I think uh, one of his biographers said it was 40,000 people 40, that he sang 000. to outside. Remember Marian Anderson? Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. That he sang to outside, outside. at the Canadian um, Four, U.S. Border, border. I think um, near Washington State uh, is where he sang. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it's just that you can't hold me. <laughs> you can't keep me down. And yes, I, I just think that that I, I just wanted to interject that. And if you may, so that I don't want to take up too much time, but I wanted to say to Tommy Mari, as I prepared for this, I had to go and read Islanda. <laughs> <laughs> Is Bar Barbara, um, Barbara Ransby, uh, who's a noted historian, has written yes. great biographies of yes. Black women. Yes. And this is... Uh, Eslanda uh, Cardoza Robeson. Mm -hmm. Her father was the fr famous uh, reconstruction politician from South Carolina, uh, yes. Francis Cardoza. She came in your know, privilege thing, and everything you can say about Robeson was her, except that she had yes. this privileged background, a PhD in anthropology. And she was right there along with him. And some, mm -hmm. uh, I think the son includes in his, in his biography, includes uh -huh. some of the letters uh, that they have before him. So I'm, I am going to wait for Tommy Marek's production of Aslanda. I have a question. Yeah. I have a question for New Orleanians. I found part of a story and I wonder if anybody else knows this story. Uh, apparently, Paul Robeson came to New Orleans in 1949, I want to say. I'm not sure if that's absolutely right. 
And he came to perform at the Coliseum, which was yeah. a, a black um, venue. Uh, but before he sang, they said he went into, um, the, the, apparently there was a boxing arena there. And he, he went into the boxing arena and he turned and he recited Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. and talked about Shakespeare from the position of, of fighting and the position of full humanity. Now, if anybody knows what he's saying or, or anything else to that story, I would love to know that. Um, I have another story though, and I'll make this one really short because I think I have an advantage that you all didn't have, which I'm very pleased to say. But in, in, in 1976, when I was uh, 24 years old, Dr. Charles Wright, who was a gynecologist in Detroit, Michigan, was trying to build the mm -hmm. Detroit African American Museum. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Charles Wright was also, also hired me to, to try to do some research on Paul Robeson, this is in 1977, because he was planning and they had already been planning the 80th birthday celebration of Paul Robeson to be held at the Ford uh, complex in Detroit. Before Paul died, there was this big celebration that was supposed to happen. Well, of course, he died in uh, 76, but they went on with the celebration and Dr. Wright sent me to New York to meet with Paul Robeson Jr. And there I stayed in their home in Paul Robeson Sr.'s home, uh, which Paul Robeson Jr. was living in with his wife and the kids. And he took me to Paul Robeson's library yes. and there were just books in so many different languages. But it was a small library, a small room. And you could not step on the floor without stepping on a book. So I ended up sitting on this pile of books and I was there for three days. I ended up sitting on these pile of books, going through all these papers and, and I would say, I want to use this picture. Can I use this picture? He Oh, you could have them. You could And I remember sitting at Paul Rome did happen at the Ford Theater in Detroit. This is And it was called An Evening with Paul Robertson. And it was it, the, the mayor and everybody was in and uh, Paul and James Earl Jones, uh, I mean, Robert Earl Jones was also uh, one of the performers of that evening, James Earl Jones's father. But I just wanted to say that in going his own personal documents and getting all of those pictures, everything that I lost in Katrina, it was just amazing to be in his space. Mm -hmm. You know, that's my story. Beautiful. That's beautiful. I, 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 if I may say, I'll just add to this, first of all, uh, Tommy, uh, uh, Tommy, what I am going to say pales in comparison <laughs> to that, and I dare follow that. Um, but I, I, I was just sitting here thinking and listening to the stories, and I'm reminded of um, an acronym that I learned uh, a few years ago about fear. Fear being false expectations appearing real. False expectations appearing real. real. And what I see at the root of all of this, 
why he had to fight so hard, why he had to declare who he was, why he did not allow himself to become a shrinking violet was to overcome those false expectations that others had of him coming right out of slavery, with his father coming right out of slavery, right? Mm -hmm. Like that, him the first generation born out of slavery. There was a preconception of how he was or people that looked like him, mm -hmm. how he would be, how he was supposed to, how he was supposed to act. And he shattered that. He shattered those expectations. And therefore, the fear set in. And the feeling of a lack of control, because mm -hmm. they could no longer maintain this illusion that we were not a, from the greatness that we were from. It had been pressed down for so long that to the masses, it appeared like it was reality and it was truth, but it was not truth. Truth crushed down to the earth, the earth. will rise. Will rise. Will rise. Yeah. Don't, don't get me started. It will rise. It will rise. And that's what he did. He rose to the occasion. And isn't it interesting that not that much has changed from then to now? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We are still having to prove ourselves in this playing field. Regardless of what we do, regardless of the amount of talent, the level of intellect that we possess and display and education, to some, we are still less than. And I think and that's that that's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. That's what makes Paul so wonderful. And, and you say, we are still having to prove ourselves. That's what makes him so unique, is that he never felt mm. that he had to prove himself. He just was. He, he just was. was. Yes. He just yes. was. And he wanted yes. everyone to know, I am all this. I'm not trying to prove myself to anyone. And it's that yes. so-called arrogance when really it was not that he just is, he just, okay? Yeah. It, was yes. that, it was that that everyone feared, which is mm -hmm. the reason why Black Lives Matter is feared by many. Drapedomania. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Self-validation is, is drapedomania still <laughs> today. <laughs> so, you know, that's, you know. In the clinical terms, uh, of where we are, <laughs> we had a shot for that one. They, they forget all about uh, COVID. <laughs> you know, even in film, and at that time in the '30s and the '40s, when black people were buffoons and and are mm. appeared to be uh, buffoons and being portrayed mm -hmm. as uh, doofus and lazy and all of the cartoons, you all over 50 or 60 you know what cartoons we used to watch yeah. um, <laughs> you know um but even then he refused to fall in that space mm -hmm. and that's a good point that you're bringing up uh you know so much so many great things have been said about mr robeson uh i'll maybe just take a little shift uh mm -hmm. and going back to even to uh paul lawrence dunbar Mm. And of his many great works, he talked about the mask. We wear we the mask. Wear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Black folk for years has been, it's it's the <laughs> the uh, juxtaposition, or it's kind of the there's the word I'm looking for where you have to balance between who we actually are, uh, who we have to be, who the dominant culture wants us to be and who the dominant culture will allow us to be. Mm -hmm. So Paul, uh, Paul Robinson came at a time when it was clear that in order to have Rhett Butler and <laughs> these types of characters, in order to have, you know, uh, Gable or these characters, that the, the black man had to be non-existent. So uh -huh. that was the reality. So when you look at um, Eugene O'Neill and Eugene O'Neill writes a Pulitzer winning play which Emperor Jones. no no before that the one that won the Pulitzer his first one it was lukewarm at best 
Nobody was really interested in it. Then he wrote Emperor Jones. Emperor Jones. And they couldn't keep the folks out of the theaters. So I watched that last night because I'm like, what's the mm -hmm. big deal? So there's two challenges for Paul Robeson. The first challenge is that he has to speak in this dialect. And it's the dialect of the people who were uh, refused the opportunity to learn the language properly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he has to speak. That's how it is. It has to be a, a where they at is, and what is, you know, that kind of language. But, right. you know, America, we have this fascination with one particular word. And that word is spelled N-I-G-G-E-R. -G -G now, Eugene O'Neill used that word 35 times. So it's funny because Paul Rosen had to make a choice. And the choice is, you know, do I do this play and allow myself, let people know who I am uh -huh. and, and say this word and be this character? Well, doing that allowed him, and that's a powerful word. I mean, you think about the, the hundreds of millions recording mm -hmm. artists and the billions of dollars that industry has made off of that particular word in uh -huh. the matter of speaking. But that role allowed the, uh, Robeson mm -hmm. to become Othello and have the longest running Shakespearean production on Broadway, right? right? Because why? Americans aren't really interested in that stuff. So you need somebody that's gonna be captivating. And he said, okay, I'm gonna play the fool. I'm gonna do this buffoonery until I have the opportunity. Mm. And uh, there's a contract that's available. They gave him full rights to decide on the cast. They just gave it to him, which was a rare thing. But I think it speaks to, to kind of the challenge. And yeah, you know, he's grown up in the 20s and the 30s. And I mean, that was a tough time. That was uh -huh. a tough time. He started an anti-lynching uh -huh. campaign. Uh -huh. I don't know if you talked about that with the NAACP. So he was an uh -huh. activist, you know, uh -huh. and he was a big, but he was 6'3". <laughs> he's the kind of brother you don't want to just see him. Say, oh, okay, whoa, what's going on here? So there was the physical <laughs> fear. Figure. Yeah. There was the intellectual fear. And I mean, he just, you know, had he now the and I know we were saying, well, what's the difference today? Well, yeah, if he were here today, I mean, you think about Bo Jackson and what he was able to do playing baseball and and football. I mean, Robeson had it all going on, and he, in a lot of ways, opened the door for a lot of the youngsters who probably have never heard of him, but are benefiting mightily from the kind of dues that he had to pay. And uh, you know, we did we have to pay pay. That, that respect. And you know, my dad was always saying, my, my, my great uncle, the, the old people used to say, if the job requires a master's degree, then get two or three. <laughs> <laughs> and then get a doctorate. Is it now they still not gonna hire you for the job, but you have learned the whole hell of a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and that was just kind of the reality of the time. I, I wanted to um, add to follow you just quickly uh, in saying that, uh, for the, for the record, it's Ida B. Wells, who's at the root of the anti-lynching campaign in the country. Yes. But in, that, in the 1940s, I mean, he's joined, uh, he joins her and others, um, but uh, he's, it, it, he challenges uh, Harry Truman uh, uh, to support the anti-lynching law uh, while protesting uh, afterwards, uh, later the Cold War, working to, and, and this is the other thing that uh, he never admitted, according to his biographers, of being a communist, uh, but he, he did go to Russia, I think in the 30s. He did spend a lot of time trying to get uh, warmer relations between the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, uh, we hear all these bad things about the communists and like and the like. However, we need to know uh, there's a wonderful book, uh, an older book called Black Marxism: The Making of Black of the Black Radical Tradition. It talks mm -hmm. about uh, the efforts of the common the Russians. I don't want to just say communists of the Russians, the Russians. Uh, to make um, the to to uh, throw this idea of racism in the face of the United States. You know, we we're getting some reverberations yeah. about that right. now, and and so um, uh, Robeson and others. Um, and there, there was a very strong movement among, among Black people uh, about this idea of uh, which is better. You'll have the noted uh, philosopher, uh, C.L.R. James, uh, who says, wait a minute, uh, you know, he lives in obscurity for a while in, in Mexico under a strange name. But uh, they're saying, well, wait a minute, <laughs> are we exchanging one kind of thing for the other? 
uh, they had to, okay. they had to reckon uh, with that. And lastly, uh, on this on this uh, what uh, Mr. Marcellus just said, Anna Julia Cooper. Um, yeah. I've spent a long time uh, studying her, wrote my doctoral dissertation on her and the like. But one of the things she wrote in a, a, a piece called The Negro's Dialect. Hmm. Um, and, uh, and here she criticized this, uh, the, the, what she calls, quote unquote, the industrious press and the theater critics of Paul Robeson's Othello. And where they said, even though he didn't say it, they said that he said, quoting, where am that handkerchief Desdemona? Anna Cooper, <laughs> who was fluent in French, knew German, uh, and, the, and the like says, she, she demonstrated extensively in that piece how that could not be. Mm. It, it, just was, it just was not, she said it wasn't possible, especially when she dissected it, it in, its, in, in, the, in the languages and, uh, and understanding it. I, I can't go too far because I'm not a linguist. Um, that, uh, that, wait a minute, this is a racist stereotype. She didn't say racist, but this is a stereotype. And Paul Robeson did not say this. Um, but the critics, if you come across, um, and some of you may have newspaper articles that, uh, that uh, ascribe that. And, and then that goes along with Sojourner Truth, whose name was Isabella Bromfrey, having those quote her in a Southern rural dialect, when as many of us know, her first language was Dutch. That's right. <laughs> and she was right, um, the yeah. slave of upstate New York, of an upstate New York family. So I just wanted to follow you, Mr. Oh, Marsalis, yeah. with well, that. I, with I that. want to clarify and I apologize for misspeaking. Uh, Ida B. Wells definitely formed the anti-lynching campaign. It was mm -hmm. 1946 and- uh, uh, in, the, in the late right, 19th but, century. It was Robeson who brought it to- yeah. It was, Paul, it, mm -hmm. it, it was Paul who brought it to international and national acclaim because he was invited to sing at the White House by President Harry Truman. And he brought along with him an anti-lynching bill co-authored by his good friend, Dr. Albert Einstein. And he presented it to Harry Truman and mm -hmm. he pointed out to him, he said that you're sending black soldiers, Negro soldiers, to help liberate European Jews from the Nazis, to That's fight right. for freedom over mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. they don't have there. They were dropping them off at Grand Central Station and Times Square in New York City, and they're getting lynched on their way as they pass through segregated counties in Georgia, the Carolinas, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, they're, Texas, Texas. they're mm -hmm. being lynched with American military uniforms still on their backs. We had families that waited three years for them to come home, and they would die two, 10 miles from the house and being lynched because they were wearing the uniform of a soldier. Right. And right. so, and they disarmed them. Okay, and so he raised his voice to Truman and he pointed in his face, and that was what led to him being blackballed and the disbarment. That's right. And right. So, right. Was, um, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, Queen, Queen yeah. Giovanni brought some uh, some of the classical things that I did not know about the opera with Robeson to me, and, and I'm so grateful for that. And I would love to when I get there talk to her about that because I did not know uh, the work he did with Beethoven. But what what, what um, um, Marcellus was saying, Delfeo was saying about um, uh, what it took. It was tremendous, the inspired madness that we call courage, that mm -hmm. rare few mm -hmm. people have. Mm -hmm. And this inspired madness, when he was cast in Showboat, Jerome Kern um, and, and um, uh, the two creators uh, of, of Showboat, okay, when they brought it there, um, uh, he was the first time on Broadway. He was opposite the young Antonio who played, uh, and that was done by young Lena Horn. And it was her first time on Broadway. And the lyrics at the time, because the culture was so just gracefully racist, it was so commonplace, the actual lyrics of Rodgers and Hammerstein and Jerome Kern's showboat were niggas all work on the Mississippi. Yeah. Niggas all work while the white mm -hmm. man plays. Mm -hmm. Lobson got out there and he says, uh, we can't, okay? And he said, later on, of course, Frank Sinatra recorded as darkies all work on the Mississippi. And they said, well, go with darkies, go with darkies, okay? <laughs> the stage being the actor's medium to where the, we live in the moment, okay, and the director doesn't get to change it. Robeson goes out there, and instead of singing, niggas all work on the Mississippi, he sings, there's an old man called the Mississippi, 
there's an old man I'd not like to be. What does yeah. he care if the world's got troubles? What does he care if the land ain't free? And for the first time, the lyrics, not only they meant, meant more, but it eventually became the new lyrics to the song. And a lot of people would not have taken that risk. When Robeson spoke up with Josephine Baker working with the, the resistance movements uh, in Europe, in France, okay? Against it, because all the composers back then that he worked with in France, they were all Jews, because only blacks and Jews played jazz music at that time, okay? And so the two most mm -hmm. despised races, when he saw them starting to, to disappear and what was going on in Berlin, he visited the Warsaw Ghetto in Poland. He recorded anti-Nazi songs in Yiddish, you know? And, and Queen Giovanni had mentioned that, uh, the, the various languages of film which Richie performed. And that's how you know he was genius because he mastered so many languages, mm -hmm. including the Slavic tongues, you know, and Swahili and several other African tongues, okay? Past the age of 21, which they say at that point, the faculty that does um, uh, languages diminishes after a certain age, but it did not with him. And so as you look at this, <clears throat> that he had to, to, to lay this on the line and to put, you know, principle before profit, you know, and risk his career, you know, for a greater humanity uh, is it, just absolutely phenomenal. But, you know, it, it, it's really, uh, it's really brilliant. And, and you're right, I.D. B. Wells did start it, but it was, was Robeson taking it to the president's desk. And they were like, what happened to the president? He yelled, why did he yell him? Because it was like, you're bringing home these soldiers that survived the Nazis and then died on the very soil for which they were fighting. And so that is, that is, that is part of the thing. And, and all of this is covered in the piece, but it, it, it's phenomenal because, um, and that's what makes him so magnificently regal and unmatched because he, in so many areas and so many aspects of it creatively. But, you know, but I, I, was, I was shocked to know the work he did with Beethoven because I, as I tell people at the end of it and in all the master classes that every form of music on the planet earth was created, created, refined and enhanced by the, except opera and classical, it has its roots in African culture. We are the, the, the artists of it. And so it, it's, uh, it's, it's a tremendous achievement, tremendous. And opera and classical probably has some, some, some little- <laughs> oh, You know what I know. know about. Oh. <laughs> Definitely. I, I didn't think you know, they took what they needed. And then, but you know, one, one thing that, that I just want to, you know, say, say briefly is with, with this raid on the Capitol has, has reminded us is that you know, by and large, black folk have never had a problem with the democratic process or with integration. It's members of the dominant society that have a major issue. And that's kind of the battle that, that we've been fighting. And I think we're going to continue to, to fight mm -hmm. because, you know, the idea of democracy existed in some of the tribal communities in Africa before folks even showed up on the American shore. For sure, democracy was a part of the Native American culture. And if you look at how they had things set up. So, you know, what we're struck with is the idea that we don't really, some of us don't really want democracy. We want something that's going to benefit us. And, you know, Robeson and so many people of color have always been trying for a long time to figure out how can we make this work. Folks, you know, they labored and they toiled on the plantations in a strange kind of a family situation. That, that to me is what the plantation was like, a real strange, odd family, trying to figure out how to make it work. And, you know, I think that, that we will continue in that struggle. And we got to just see if, if, if everybody really wants to come together and not just give lip service to democracy, but actually put it where it needs to be. Right. And Rules and precedent was set up to, to um, curtail um, people from advancing that were enslaved. That's the, those are the issues that, that we'll never get out from under in, in this country because the rules were not set up for the people who stormed the Capitol last week. <laughs> that's that's not what it was about at all. And that's why they so brazenly went in with no fear mm -hmm. where, where 15,000 people show up and one person uh, gets shot. <laughs> so uh, having faced that again, when anyone, and especially someone like a Robeson, and he's at the same time as Marcus Garvey and all of the other people who are coming up with what are known as black nationalist movement, uh, or basically people who can speak for not just themselves. They don't mind if you, Jack Johnson is a, you know, he's uh, 
still around. These people are still there. If you only got rich and you shut up and didn't do anything else, that would be okay. But when you say that this is not about me, it's about all my people and anyone like me who has not been uh, given full rights to humanity. Uh, then they start to, that's why I was mentioning drapedomania, which was the clinical term for uh, a crazy Negro who would stand up to someone like Harry Truman or anyone that was supposed to be in, in authority above them. Because if you look up, and as they used to say, you can't ride my back unless I bend down at you on top of me and, and ride me. You know, it's not happening. And when when those things are presented, man, they'll be presented all over again uh, to challenge the the uh, bending of the rules or the fact that rules were meant for other people and not for a certain group of people. Mm -hmm. That's when the insurrection starts. Uh, but also, that's how America was created. Well, I want to say that. Um, <laughs> that it, it, oh, I'm sorry. I, I want to say. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. I'll say one, just one quick thing. I mean, to Bruce's point, that's kind of the defining line between a Josephine Baker and a Paul Robeson. Paul Robeson came back to America to have the fight. He came here on the. He came. He came here, became subject to all of the inequity and the racism. And when McCarthy canceled his passport, that pretty much ruined him financially. Yeah. And after, in the late 60s, uh, as I recall, Coretta Scott King invited Josephine Baker to come and be a cultural ambassador and an agent for change in the United States. And Josephine Baker said, no, thanks. She stayed in Europe. And I'm not and to your point. No one begrudges her for doing that. She was afraid for her children. But when you look at what Paul Robeson did, when he said, I could, he could have never come back to the United States and been a wealthy, happy man. He chose to come back to the, to the place where he was born, where he knew he would f face all his adversity, face all these terrific challenges, and he did it anyway. And that's kind of the, that, that's, 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 that's the big choice that as a towering historical figure he made, that is why he's so important. He came back, he fought the fight, even though society was fighting against him the whole time. I, I think that uh, your discussions on fear, um, courage, all of the things um, ask, uh, lends itself to ask the question um, that so many people, non non uh, white people, if you will, might ask, and that is, why do they hate us so much? And and I, it is in part there, are, I think for every person we can explain, but historically it is rooted in the fear that was instituted by enslavers who chose uh, to hold people in bondage against their will, that they lived constantly in the fear of revolt. And sometimes, you know, it did happen. Um, revolts happen not only uh, with the big ones that you know, but historians have shown us there were poisonings uh, of families. Um, there were any number of other ways that revolts happened. And so here the end of slavery into Reconstruction, and you have an elite class to convince the masses of white people um, that they should fear the masses of black people when it gave it a wonderful opportunity at that time for those two groups um, to come together and to, to make a different kind of world. And so we have lived in this country since slavery, or the enslavement of people to the present of non-Black people or the dominant class living in fear and those who are in power convincing masses that they have to fear us. And so there is no, there has been no shortage of conversations about the differences between what, it, what happened last summer with Black Lives Matter protests when they were confronted by police officers and others, and how these people were so brazen to go into the Capitol and put themselves um, on the internet and everywhere else. 
because they, I think someone just said they had no fear of repercussions because this was supposed to be their right, but they feared. So the fear historically has transcended. So that's why, uh, Ms. Mm. Mari, they would fear um, Paul Robeson. They would right. fear other people and um, I'm, I'm just, forgetting her name and forgive me, those of you who are in theater and, and entertainment, um, who went to the, invited the actress, uh, made famous cat woman. Oh, oh, Eartha Kitt. Eartha, Eartha, Eartha Kitt. Who herself was the same, treated the same and banished because she's sitting there asking, why are the only other black people in here working as servants? Uh, she mm -hmm. suffered from that. And so anytime that you see Black people rise up to question, why isn't the union perfect? Uh, and then we are trying to make it perfect. It is translated as fear from the other uh, against us. And therefore we suffer all of these harsh realities that are imposed upon us. We have a couple of questions I wanna throw out. Um, I also haven't had a chance to hear yet from Diane. Diane, do you wanna jump in before I go to the questions? Oh, let me unmute you. There you go. She's not, she's not unmuted. Yeah, I've got you. We can hear you. Can't hear her. Can't hear her. <laughs> she's on. not unmuted. She might have I to unmute herself. herself. <laughs> she might have to unmute herself. She has to accept. Yeah, I've yeah. I've asked, I've hit the ask you to unmute button. Hit the unmute button. Now you can, there you go. Mm -mm. We can't mic, nope. click the mic. Click the mute button. It keeps on. I think. It... <laughs> <laughs> okay, you you sign language in Delphi or uh, in <laughs> and go. <laughs> Just type it in the direct message. <laughs> uh, or the chat. Let me see. Uh, let me do it that way. In the chat. Yeah. In the, in the chat. The chat can. Um... <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's the button, lower left-hand corner. Yeah, the microphone symbol. She, she's like, you talking? Yeah. yeah. And if I mute you. Yeah, and as you were speaking about that, uh, um, uh, about the folks in the Capitol, uh, two-thirds of those people are out of jail. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they, they were merely identified and turned to loose, basically. You, uh, you know, the moment, the moment like when this country, party. The, the, the moment when the decision was made about this country, it wasn't reconstruction or it wasn't, it, it was when all of the Confederate officers got off. None of them was hung by the neck. That's right. John Brown led an insurrection. Of course, he was on the other side and all his men was hung by the neck except for a couple. So the message has been clear for a long time that, you know, because here are people, and who was it that said brilliantly that the, the Confederates didn't succeed in getting their flag into the Capitol in the 1860s? Sure. Mm. And it didn't get there till last week. And it's That's like, right. you know, until we really make a take a stringent stance, you know, just imagine if, if we let the Nazis go and didn't have the Nuremberg trials. And just say, hey, fellas, you know, look, we. We get it, just try to keep that down, will you? Yes. I mean, you know, it's just what it is. It's, so folks see that there's not really a, a, a stiff penalty for being anti-American and having those Confederate ideals. I think they they don't, they think that the Confederate ideals are actually somehow American and they're just not. Well, core they, principles. So that's, that's tough. You know, I think this whole conversation about Paul Robinson gives us all the opportunity. Um, and it's sad that COVID is going on right now, uh, Kenyatta, because this would have been a wonderful learning opportunity for so many of the schools. Mm -hmm. And with this, but, but this should not stop any of us or all of us um, to bring to the forefront uh, again to this generation uh, who this man was and the inspiration that he gave to us all. I don't think Paul was trying to change anybody's minds in how they view him. 
I think he was trying to give all of us the courage to have a voice. Mm -hmm. And are. that yeah. became his goal. Mm. Right. So. And that's the most powerful you stuff. questions that, you said, Todd? Yeah, yeah. I just a couple. One of them says, um, this is Mark, who says, thanks for this informative discussion that he would love to learn more about Robeson and see um, there are many biographies. Which ones would the panel recommend? And I'm still trying to unmute Diane. Well, Miss Baham posted to everyone just now. Yep, I think who the there in the chat is some answers to that question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Here the, I stand. Yeah, that's his autobiography. Here I stand. Mm -hmm. Is is yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yes, here I stand, and, and which, oh, yeah. which became his mantra, by the way. Mm -hmm. And and uh, but I, I I think it was a it's a beautifully written book, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it it and it deals with all of who he was. Mm -hmm. Right. This and that. Jared says, I know this is more related to film than theater, but I thought I'd ask. The film version of The Emperor Jones is one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, it can be, let me see where they go. Um, it can be funny, epic, and ultimately dark throughout it. I know it's been acknowledged by the, by the Criterion Video Collection, mm -hmm. um, um, but, we're, but why isn't it more acknowledged in our current era? Maybe as I've heard, it's because Paul disowned it, um, but it's still, in my opinion, a significant part of cinema history. But wanted to get some thoughts on this. So yeah. I, re I responded to that. Uh, you did? You did? Maybe Can I, I hear oh. your answer? Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I said it right there. I said, you know, it's a tough one. It's, the movie is important in one respect, but if you imagine Clark Gable or Marlon Brando using that similar type of language as an, a leading character, you know, that, that's what the rub is. The rub is that, you know, in our, in Robeson and everyone's attempts to embrace what is American and embrace uh -huh. their identity, you know, it's it's always it always, especially in that period, it had to be the coarse language, the the lack of intellect, the, the lack of smarts in a certain mm -hmm. respect. Mm -hmm. So the movie, you know, I watched the movie and I'm just like, oh my God. Just just imagine if he would have had something to actually deal with that would have showed off his brilliance, like Otello ended up doing. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's like, you know, who is it that has to say and gone with the wind? I don't know nothing about birthing no babies. Right. Yeah. So here you have a, a brilliant actress, someone who is capable of achieving heights, and that's what that's what she has to do. That's she has to down to that, yeah. and that's yeah. been the rub for you know, man, ten more than this. The list goes. I mean, there's so many people, mm -hmm. so many people in entertainment, Bill Bojangles Robinson, mm -hmm. who had to deal with personas mm -hmm. and characterizations far beneath what they were capable of. Mm -hmm. So that's you know when when. You know, watching that movie, I don't watch that movie and, and think, oh man, what a great movie. It's just like, man, this is what he had. This is, you know. But you like know, this is also what was written. And that yes. is very important. This is also what was written, okay, by oh, a white course. man mm -hmm. for black people to say perspective. <laughs> this is what was written. You know, Lorraine Hansberry got off of her deathbed and gave the the, the, the to be young, gifted, and black uh, lecture. But she ended that lecture by saying one thing. She said, you are young, gifted, and black, but you must write about it. Mm -hmm. You have to write about it. When you deal with the, the opera, and you deal with the dance, and you deal with the music, and you deal with you know, we, we do these things so well simply because this was the only way to preserve our story. Not his story, not his story, but to preserve our story. And the way to preserve it was through the art, which is the, this, this, especially here in New Orleans, which is the reason why you have a city that is 68% that is African-American, yet you don't have not one black owned theater. But that is only because of the fact that the story does not want to be heard as told by us. Only those stories that you pick for us to, to do, which is the reason why I told one 
uh, theater company. Uh, no, I will not direct a black musical at a white theater. Okay? Why? Because I'm sick of black people singing and dancing for white people because that's the only way they can accept who we are. But mm. when you see a man like Paul Robeson, who is who 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 started out trying to do their bidding in a way, but then realized that he was being hemped in a way, he decided mm. that he had to make a choice between his art and his activism. Mm. And then he began to use the art as his platform for his activism. And that's what he did in his in doing the whole uh, uh, songs about the our the songs from slavery, um, the the work songs. That's Old what Virginia. he did when yeah. he did all the worker yeah. songs for those who were working in in in, in the mines in, in Europe. That's what he did. He decided to use the art as activism. Since you won't write about that, I'm gonna yeah. sing about it. <laughs> And let me, uh, I think, uh, if you don't mind, let me follow this up with what Robinson says, New York. He, he's writing, it's more like a swan song. It's at the end of uh, Here I Stand. And I think uh, Ms. Myrick this just fits so perfectly here. Uh, he's he's uh, responding here. It, was, it had been some time since the autobiography had been written. And so here is, a, uh, in the appendix, is a letter that he wrote to... Um, <clears throat> to respond to people wanting to know what happened to you. You know, he had right. been uh, in quote unquote, some kind of exile here in the country. Quoting, it is especially heartening to me to see the active and often heroic part that leading Negro artists, singers, actors, writers, comedians, musicians are playing today in the freedom struggle. Today, it is the Negro artist who does not speak out, who is uh -huh. considered to be out of line, and even the white audiences have largely come around to accepting the fact that the Negro artist is and has every right to be quite controversial. Yes, it is good to see all those transformations. It is heartening also to see that despite differences in program and personalities among Negro leadership, the concept of a united front of all forces and viewpoints is gaining ground. He said, there's much more to be done, to be done but right. thank God almighty, we're moving. Signed, Paul Robeson, August 28th, 1964. Mm. I think that that works so well to follow what you just said. And can I add this? One of the things that I would like to uh, original uh, just just a little bit for the, the the original question, which was about Emperor Jones and why people uh, why it's not more popular. I, I believe that the complexity of the character that he played. Mm. I mean, he played what he had to play, but he did the same thing in Body and Soul. And I look at those those mm. hearts as deeply complex uh, for anyone who watches them. Uh, Emperor Jones is not that popular among black people, and neither was body and soul at the time. It was kind of like the banjo <laughs> in New Orleans. Mm. The, the, the instrument itself on a national level is looked at as hokum. It's looked at, it's looked down upon by Negroes, African Americans of color, black people, mm -hmm. uh, and everyone else because of the complexity. What he does is, is he plays a full gamut of human uh, possibilities. Uh -huh. And Emperor Jones, he shows a, a fairly dark side of, of what Negroes do with power when they get their hands on it. But it's, uh -huh. also, it's also current in the time to speak to what has happened to Haiti <laughs> uh, in the context mm -hmm. of being occupied by America and the manipulation that our government does uh, across the board in many, many places. It was a testing ground for the US government to see how they can manipulate and overthrow other governments and place people in those places that would do their bidding. Uh -huh. uh, from Nicaragua, from Honduras, from El Salvador. For, I mean, it's just a precursor to it 
uh, black people at that time on the national scene didn't really want to see uh, that ugly side of of who they could be if they had power. But but when we look at it, <laughs> and the, and human. what what has happened, those things are there because they were born out of the colonial idea and uh, and the concept of power. Uh, same thing with body and soul. Uh, the black preacher who, uh, who who would dare to do all of the things that he did that, in there. That he did and still be doing uh, these are human um, reactions and very complex and uh, as we say in the skull and bone game you are next uh, nobody likes to see a look death dead in the face they don't like it or if you don't mind it if you're not afraid then your reaction is going to be like looking in the mirror you either run uh -huh. into it or you're running away from it one of the two but but just to have the audacity to stop and stare when he lays out Yes, this is who we are. Um, and, and do people talk like this? Damn right they do. Uh, uh, but there are reasons for it. It doesn't mean that you're less of a human. Uh, that's an easy one. That's a, uh, people who feel like they have more education across the gambit when they hear someone speak. This is how Creole was thought of in, in many places uh, because it was born out of uh, folks who were enslaved. Um, and it's still thought of that way in Louisiana. Um, in that way, people who, who speak French, uh, they don't like it. They, they think it's buffoonery. They call it the toi tu parles petit nègre. You talk a little nigger talk. Um, mm. and, and it's still used that way. And mm -hmm. when he was speaking that way on that island, uh, and the mm. word for man or woman in Creole is neg. I'd mm. like to ask, uh, I'd like to so ask Kenyatta a question. Complex. I'd like to ask Kenyatta a question about preparing to be Paul, mm -hmm. preparing to be Paul, because I've directed one character shows about legendary artists. And what I have found that a lot of artists do is what they do is give their version of who this person is so you are going to be doing your piece so are you paul well, do we see paul absolutely i i feel that there's there's a there's a transformation that takes place um uh now i've been doing the show since touring the show since 1999 i've done over 458 shows in 17 countries um i wrote the piece um, I wrote it like a movie, so it opens with his father there, which shows the struggle to be free and where he got his um from, and uh, uh, starting him, the first time you meet Paul, it's right before his sixth birthday, and he's in uh, New Jersey, and his mother's baking him a cake, and of course back then the slaves made their own clothes, so it's fire retardant, they cook with coal, her dress caught on fire, and he watched her burn to death. It's the watershed moment in his life, and that's where you meet Paul, and you pick it up there. We come in with, um, uh, after opening with a, a thing from Nas and uh, the, the Slave Escape, it comes in with the soundtrack from Roots, Let's Embulu, Hugh Masekela, um, and uh, the Watts Line Choir coming up with that soundtrack. Um, it's a transformation. Uh, I wrote the piece, uh, it's like a prayer for our forsaken and forgotten ancestors, you know, and for those who... Um, you know, I have this, this model that, you know, those that live to tell must tell. Um, there's a prayer that I say before it, I take some ancestors on stage with me. And um, the prayer I say before coming out is for all of those who are here and those who are not here, but desire to be here. And that and all the broken dreams and the broken promises and everything else, because it, it's a spiritual piece for me. Um, I didn't come to Hollywood to do that, but I'm a six foot five inch leading man that looks younger than my age and everyone is telling me, you don't look like a criminal, so we can't play a criminal. Why? Because your teeth are too white, your teeth are too straight, and your skin is too clear. And, and I'm going like, but I was a juvenile felon and I had three felony arrests before my 13th birthday. <laughs> it was like, but nonetheless, this thing to where, you know, um, it was given to me uh, to basically save my life. And every time I thought I was not going to do it anymore, 
I either got an eviction notice or um, an impound <laughs> car or something that said to you to where God sent me a message saying, God is trying to tell you something, yes. you know, and so the save stage me, saved me because uh, like most actors in Hollywood, we're all just basically surviving and praying and hoping that our dreams will come rescue to us. And so it was Paul that came and got me. This man so when do you come to town? Uh, when are you coming? There. I'm, I'm coming the 21st. I will be there the night of uh, the Saturday and, and for a Sunday matinee. And um, uh, right now sales are lagging. I'm doing uh, Good Morning New Orleans um, uh, tomorrow, Monday morning. And I'm uh-huh. uh, uh, doing some um, uh, radio stuff to promote it. But it's, it's sold out around the world and each show sells the other one. Um, uh, it's a piece. I have five wardrobe changes. We cover all the music from not just Robeson, but um, uh, Hugh Masekela, uh, Duke Ellington, Count Basie. Fats Waller, you know, all the way to the soundtrack of Roots. Um, and there are two Swahili songs. It opens and closes with a song, Kole Bajao, in Swahili, uh, which means many rains ago, about the sacred baobab tree. Um, it is a spiritual piece that ties us together through these rivers uh, that flows, that brings all of our hopes and our dreams through it. Um, uh, for me, it is um, uh, it, it is everything. It, it literally has saved my life. And um uh, I've toured um, with my wife of 22 years, um, is my stage manager, and so it's become a thing that's basically um, taken me everywhere where I hope theater and film would have. And so, you know, it, it's, um, you know, and at the end, I tell a really profound story, because everyone always asks me, why is this, you know, because they say, you're crying, this is such a, a, a demanding piece, why, why is it so important to you? And I said, it's important because Robeson is proof that one person can make a tremendous difference, even if that one person is not around to see the great difference that they made. And I said, without Robeson, we would have never had Barack Obama as president. Now people say, well, that's a bit of a stretch they never met. Because I explained to him, in his heyday, Robeson was a mentor to a lot of other artists. Among them, his number one mentee was the great Jamaican, Harry Belafonte, and his best friend from Cat Island, Bahamas, Sidney Poitier. And when they, him, Robeson and Bill Bojangles Robinson went to see Branch Rickey about bringing a Negro into Major League Baseball. They came all the way to Pasadena, California to get the grandson of a Louisiana slave, Jackie Robinson. And those three became his primary mentees. He taught them several things, but among them, three things in particular. He said the number one way to advance in the society is through education, that educated societies do less harm to their fellow citizens. The number two things was like mm. that the continental African and the African in America were one people. The third thing was that he said successful African Americans have a cultural and a moral obligation to try to get a quality education for African students back in, uh, on the mainland. And so in 59, Belafonte, Portier, and Jackie Brown started a foundation to pay for college for qualified African students. None of the lower 48 states wanted them to come. They said, we don't want Africans coming here. We don't care who's paying for them. But our new state was Hawaii. And Hawaii said, well, we haven't been part of America long enough to learn how to hate anybody yet. We're kind of brown ourselves. If you want, you could send them here. So he said, fine, we'll send them to the University of Hawaii. So Belafonte, Portier, and Jackie Robinson flew off to Africa, went to West Africa. Okay? And the requirements were you had to speak fluent English, you have to be a high school graduate, and you have to pass the college entrance examination test. They started in West Africa, went through Central Africa, all the way to East Africa. They found in 18 African nations, 72 students who passed the test and fit the criteria. And they flew all of them to study at the University of Hawaii. Among those students was a brilliant Muslim boy from the mountainsides of Kenya. He was brilliant in the math and sciences. And the name of that young Muslim boy was none other than Barack Obama. And that's how he got the University of Hawaii. So in the piece, there's this parallel Okay, because, and of course, later on um, in his senior year, he fell in love with uh, Ann Dunham and uh, her third trim- her first tri- in their first, first trimester, they got married and she bore him a son and he named his firstborn son in America after himself, Barack Hussein Obama. Okay, mm. that before going off to study global economics. Now, in the beginning of the piece, it starts off with a female. The first boy, uh, character in the play is Harry Tubman. There's an African proverb, in his, and it's in the Quran as well, that civilization begins at the feet of woman, because yeah. without an upright and pure woman, it is impossible to build a righteous nation. 
-hmm. and that the woman is the most important person in Islam to the African because it's the only relationship where God took one person and created two. And mm -hmm. so it starts with this African slave girl, Harriet Tubman, who the abolitionists helped. She went back to find other people because she left her and she vowed she would go back to free her relatives. She found other slaves. On one of those trips, she found a 15 year old slave boy named William Drew from the Robeson Plantation. She took William Drew to Philadelphia on the Underground Railroad. She had no idea that she was starting a series of events and that William Drew would fight in the Civil War, use that money to go to a, a historical black college, Lincoln University, who hosted the play and was shocked when I told him the story. And William Drew went to Lincoln University, studied theology, became a minister. He yeah. later married um, the Philadelphia school teacher, Eslan, I mean, um, Maria Busto. Uh -huh. And an educated, a college educated father, pastor, and a school teacher mother had four children and they homeschooled them. And so the kids were brilliant because they were homeschooled by a college educated and school teacher. And then 14 years later, they had this son, Paul, who they named after the apostle Paul. This, this unexpected child that they had. And he was taught by his older sisters and brothers. He played football with him, he was bigger, he was stronger, he was smart, and he thought like an adult because he was always around adults. He was way ahead of his time. And Harriet Tubman had no idea that she would start a series of events. And that movement she did by bringing that slave to Philadelphia so he could meet his wife, so they could have these kids. And that this Robeson would influence in an America with a liberal immigration policy, a Jamaican named Belafonte. <laughs> a Bahamian named Poitier, and the son of a Louis, the great grandson of a Louisiana slave, uh, uh, Jackie Robinson, to go all the way to West Africa, go through West Central Africa, to go all the way to East Africa, bring back the boy who would later become the man who would have the boy that would become our very first black president. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fascinating mm -hmm. and to prove that there are no accidents in God's universe. In his final year in office, that first black president issued a decree the United States Treasury to take a white male off United States currency and replace that him with a her, and that her is none other than Harriet Tubman. So I think it's a divine work, and I, and I bring it there because, uh, as Robeson said, the whole thing wasn't so much to be rich and famous, but to have a life of purpose that would somehow yeah. shape and uplift That's the it. race that has done so much for me and, and, and how I embrace it because. Uh, as people used to say, uh, Stogie, we knew you were black. We saw your name. It was like, <laughs> if your name was Blackie Black, it's outside of Tupac Shakur, it's, 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 it's so black. But this thing is where I, I so embrace it and hold it to my heart because I know that, um, like Marvin Gaye said, and Tupac reminded us that black is the best thing that you could ever be. Hmm. Thank you, Stogie. Thank you. Thank you, every single one of you. This has been a tremendous um, experience. There, uh, this is not even the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more to discuss. Um, uh, maybe we'll have to do this again. And uh, because I mean, this, I, as she told me, you said it, that it has always been the arts who have led social change. Historically, yeah. it always has been. and. There is so much social change that needs to be led today. And we in the arts, I mean, everyone on this panel here are involved with the arts and performing in some way or another. And we as artists owe it to society to, again, I'm stealing something else from Tommy, to not create, um, um, not create history, but to create our story. And I, um, we are, I think in the beginning of a great opportunity, and I, if we just grab it, if we just grab the opportunity and, and we all just do it together and move. So Stogie will be on stage Jan, or January 23rd, 24th. And um, you can go to our website at jps.org to get tickets. Um, everyone on our panel, I will thank you again, your knowledge, your background, your personal experiences, they are absolutely priceless. I'm very sorry we lost Diane, but we were going to do something with Diane separately. I saw her send a message right here. Um, we'll do it again. She says, yes, please. <laughs> All my subjects are passionate about. Todd, I want to say one thing. To, uh, but I want to say one thing to, to you and to Dennis at JPAS. Um, 
I think that um, putting together the seminar, bringing in this particular production is a start. And mm -hmm. I, and I want to uh, tell you, um, thank you um, mm -hmm. for the conversation. And I think it is important that any show that you, uh, JPAS decides to do in the very near future that has anything to do with social justice and in particularly having to do with African-American social justice, I think a panel discussion or a symposium is needed. As, mm -hmm. as all of us who are here on this panel today, we know everything there is to know about white people in America. Mm -hmm. uh, historically, <laughs> from an artistic standpoint, scientifically, uh, morally, um, from a the the theology standpoint, but I also think it's important to know us as intellectuals and as um, activists that these panel discussions are very, um, very instrumental and I think it's a great step forward. Yes. Thank yes. you very much for yes. being, yes. all of you. I mean, it's, um, I, I, I said this to somebody else as, as a 50 year old white man, I don't have a whole lot to say. And I just, I, I, I don't. And so I'm gonna find the experts who I can sit and listen to. And, um, and then we listen, we learn and uh, we build. And I'm thrilled, absolutely every single one of you that you were here today. Um, and we, I look forward to it. I do think that we, um, I think that we should have discussions going forward. And that this is only the very, very beginning. And as Giovanna said, the entire nation is moving in this, in the direction of, of change. And I was actually thinking about it today and I, that, you know, the movements that started six months ago are, are quiet now. There was yet another man that was shot and killed this weekend in Texas, and it's mm -hmm. common. And um, and I don't want it to become quiet. I don't want it to become quiet. And the only way to not let it become quiet is to not let it become quiet. And that's <laughs> what we're going to do: is is keep talking and keep doing. And you are your willingness to be part of this conversation means the world to me. So thank, thank you, you every for inviting thank you, me. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank, thank you, for inviting me. Is, is thank you to all the panel as well who is out there. And Stogie, you want a close word? Uh, yeah, I, I would say uh, if there's students or um, uh, some uh, disadvantaged folks that are out there that uh, uh, can't, you know, in this time put together the money, uh, inv invite them to come anywhere as, as my guests and uh, later on they can pay what they can because uh, we're more important than getting the message out because it's, it's rare that, you know, uh, we get to do that. I've done NOCA um, before and I've had like 600 students at NOCA and um, I wanted to do something for the, uh, the late great um, who's been an idol of mine from way back from when I first found um, uh, Coltrane because we used to hang out, you know, in New York. I played around the corner from the Blue Note. And so Ellis Marcellus and what he's accomplished is just monumental. And, um, uh, and, and so, um, but I want to do something in tribute to him at NOC at some point, and hopefully when things clear up and we get to get back in there, that'll be nice. But, um, but I, I didn't want uh, economics to stop, you know, if they're going to be at BCC, we may as well fill them because um, it's the souls that we care about and you don't know whom you're feeding. And so somewhere we could figure the rest of it out later on because um, uh, you don't do theater for money, clearly. And um, <laughs> so, um, uh, it, it used to be like uh, what jazz was, um, you know, um, and, and so, but, but none the, nonetheless, um, uh, I look forward to seeing all of you, uh, especially Queen Giovanna, because um, um, you have in, information about uh, classical music that I, I, I did not know, and I did not know the, some of the things that he transcribed. But I was aware of the Sydney House, because uh, they did name it after him. There's, um, and um, and in, in the University of London, um, the entire dormitory things are called the Paul Robeson's residence houses. Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, it, it's globally this, uh, this son of a slave has taken it, but he said it before in, uh, in, in the 19, uh, at the end of uh, World War II, he said, while nations may go to war, it's always arts and culture that unites us. And so it, it, it's, a, it's a monumental thing because it was through arts and culture when they would ask Charlie Bird Parker and and Duke Ellington, all these questions when they perform for in Latin America and in Asia, and they say, "How do you get? How do you write? Take the apron? How do you make the horn cry? Sarah Vaughan, how do you make me sing? How does this? How does it make me feel?" Like they said, well, and everybody had the same answer: "God puts it in my head, and my heart, and it comes out of my fingers and my mouth." 
And it was only then that they said, the Asian, the African, said to them, and the Latin American said, well, if God is speaking to you, then maybe you too are a human being. Maybe you're not to be fixed of a man. Maybe you too are a child of God. And it took arts and culture for the world to see our shared yet common humanity. And that is one of the reasons why it's so important to push this because it was through this, because, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a Jamaican born street kid from Brooklyn, Brownsville, one of the toughest neighborhoods in Brooklyn, New York. And um, the fact that I've traveled the world, you know, with a story about someone who, like me, that was, you know, laid on their dreams and laid on their bills, you know, um, that it, it's, uh, it, it means the world to me. So I look forward to seeing you guys. Um, you know, New Orleans is globally known because you've sent your message across the world with your artists, you know. And even though um, uh, Satchmo, who claimed New York because he lived not far from my sister's house in Queens, you know, but and I do mention him there in the show. He, he covered uh, as this is music, you know. Um, so yeah, but but I look I look forward to it, and I, and I look forward to seeing all of you, uh, Ivan, Eva, Timothy, Tommy, uh, Sun Pie, great nickname, and he still looks like he plays. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, so, uh, but 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 I look forward to seeing all of you. Okay, and of course uh, the legendary um, uh, son of Ellis, um, which is, is what you know. Mr. Mark Thank Ellis. you very very much, and whatever you do, I never piss it. off your stage manager. <laughs> well, she's in the journey with me. And, uh, and you'll, you'll get to meet her. So, uh, but I, but I look forward to seeing all of you, and uh, uh, it, it's going to be fantastic, you know. And uh, and for God's sakes, please win on Sunday. Um, okay. The Saints. That is all right. Go Saints. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful evening. Yeah. Thank you all again. We'll see you all Thank next you. week. Good night. Thank you. Good night, Good night all. Night. Take care. Good night.